When we uh, moved here in 1991, my two daughters, Hannah and Philippa, were 13 and 9. And uh, going to the British school was not an option in those days because <clears throat> the, I, th I think the British school only took children up to the age of 15 or 16 and they completed what we call in the UK GCSEs. After that to take their A-levels, their sort of senior high school years, they would have had to go back to the UK. <clears throat> and that was never an option, boarding school or anything like this. So we decided to put them into the International School Manila, which was quite a challenge because uh, it was essentially an American curriculum. Uh, very different ways of doing business. Things that we would have taken for granted in a curriculum were all extracurricular activities. Um, so it was that that really was quite a, 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 a stressful time. And of course, in those days, they were being bussed every morning into Manila on a full size bus. The Kinder through the, the first school, middle school, high school, all on this one large bus that would set off at about six o'clock or so in the morning to get to Makati. Well, the discipline of getting up and going to school every day certainly didn't do the girls any harm. Uh, and I'll explain them more about that in a moment. <coughs> but over the years, the trip into Manila did become more challenging. They got rid of the big bus. They started putting the kids on, on coasters, which certainly made getting through the traffic in Manila a little easier. But then they started to build the Skyway and the other roadworks. So by the time our younger daughter, Philippa, finished school in 1999, they were leaving Los Banos at 4.30 in the morning. Phil was doing the, the International Baccalaureate program uh, and had a lot of homework. So leaving, getting up at four o'clock in the morning, getting on the bus at 4.30. Fortunately, most of them used to take their blankets and pillows and curl up and go back to sleep. More difficult for me having got up at four o'clock to go back to sleep. But anyway, uh, and then perhaps get home around about five or so in the afternoon. Um, she'd go for a swim. She'd uh, uh, then have homework up until about midnight four hours sleep back on the bus the following morning this you know i think for everybody got a bit stressful so i think we all celebrated when in in june uh, 1999 she finished finished school well anyway hannah had 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 finished school in 95 and took a gap year went back to the uk studied psychology and anthropology for two years at a university um, and became rather disillusioned with the UK education system and persuaded us to let her move to the US in 1998, which she did. She went to St. Paul to McAllister College and graduated in 2000 top of a class. So, uh, and then went on and, and, and got a teaching assistantship at the University of Minnesota and completed her PhD in psychology in 2006 got married the same year and is now living in the US. Philippa uh, finished and took a gap year, went to, went to Canada for a year and then went to the University in Durham in the UK. And what did she study? Psychology. So I'm not quite sure whether this was the, the Jackson experience or whether it was the Erie experience or a combination of all of the above but <laughs> two botanists have spawned two psychologists and Philippa has just submitted the first draft of a complete PhD thesis and expects to get it examined in the next few weeks. So uh, uh, I think their academic success is also due to the, to the, the discipline that they had to follow in essentially getting up, going to school, doing their work, uh, etc. Um, also, going to an international school, I think there's a lot of, it's quite competitive. But Erie is also a very competitive place. And uh, I think um, we have probably higher than average uh, 
attainment rates amongst our children uh, at Erie. Uh, I'm not saying we put a lot of pressure on them, but you know, when you've grown up in a society where every neighbour is the um, the father or mother of a of of your parents' uh, colleagues at work, most of them have got PhDs. There's a very sort of high pressure environment to to achieve, and and it's great to see so many of the children going off and achieving, and uh, so we're delighted that our two daughters have 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 made are beginning to make their mark, even though it's in a very different field from the one in which we ourselves trained. Because what I hadn't said is that Steph, my wife, is also trained in genetic resources and she worked at uh, the International Potato Centre for a number of years as well. Uh, an, an intense experience. So it's, and, 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 and some colleagues wonder how I've been able to manage this sort of life-work balance. And I think that is extremely important that anybody that comes to work at Erie maintains a good balance between their work and, and their social life. And I also intensely believe it's very important to have a private life. And I remember when I came to Erie in 91 and discussing with the then Director General, Dr. Klaus Lampe, I said, um, eight to five, I'm Aries. After, fi after five o'clock in the morning, in the afternoon, sorry, after five o'clock in the afternoon and before eight o'clock in the morning, that's my time. And I share my time with the Institute on, on my terms and, and, and have maintained that over the, the time I've been here and, and, and have kept a private life, uh, which I think is, is also, you know, kept this, this balance very important. So what to do? Well, I had never thought in my life that I would ever go scuba diving, uh, but it was clear that you know, with the coast so close, we would go down and, and have a look. And I'd never actually been snorkeling before I came to the Philippines. And my first experience of snorkeling, I thought, this is wonderful, I don't need to do anything else, I'll just snorkel for the rest of my time. But then Hannah took a dive course, and uh, in the early 90s, there were large groups of staff that were taking the dive course together. And so in 93, I thought, well, I'll give this a try. And I haven't looked back, and uh, in just a week or so's time, I shall complete my 355th dive at Anilau. I've been diving there for 17 years. Uh, and uh, it's been a tremendous experience. Uh, I don't think I shall dive again unless I'm on holiday somewhere. I, it's not something I should do in the UK, it's too cold. Uh, but it has been a fantastic experience uh, to, to take up scuba diving. Um, and again, it's been a, a hobby through which I've met a lot of new people uh, who just share that enthusiasm and in some cases passion for, for getting in the water and going down to a hundred feet or so and seeing all this beautiful wildlife. Uh, the corals here in the Philippines and the, and, the, and the fauna are just spectacular and it's been a great privilege to, to have been able to do that. Um, in the early 90s as well there was a group of us that like to sort of uh, drop our inhibitions a little bit towards Christmas and we had a, a few years when we had uh, Christmas pantomimes. The pantomime is, a, is really a, a very strong British tradition. Rather outrageous uh, uh, entertainment, a short play, often based on a fairy tale and we, we, we had a number of those uh, uh, in I think 90 three, ninety four, ninety five. A group of us got together, fortunately bolstered by some semi professional support from Manila. Uh, they were the sort of they, they provided the foundation against around which the rest of us floundered and made complete asses of ourselves. But in doing so I think we I think well we certainly had a great time. We hope the audience did. The probably the um, 
the most outrageous part I played was in the last pantomime I, uh, I, 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 I figured, which was based on the story of Robin Hood. And I played the part of Prince John. But I don't know how it developed, but I ended up wearing a long blonde wig, extremely heavy makeup, and being of dubious sexuality. <laughs> Uh, but we we had a lot we had a lot of fun and we think the audience uh, we the audience had a lot of fun and uh, in some ways I've been involved in a number of things like that uh, while I was an undergraduate uh, performing short uh, it's a bit like I don't know if you've heard of the Cambridge Footlights Review but you know in, in a university groups get together and they they put on small reviews and plays and, and and I sort of came out of out of that I did some of that at Southampton. I also used to do um, a lot of folk dancing in my younger days before arthritis took over. Um, there's, uh, I used to do Scottish dancing, more of the full kilt, um, and English country dancing, and also a, a type of dancing called Morris dancing, which is just for men. You know, a, uh, very traditional dancing going back a thousand years or more, wearing bells, waving handkerchiefs, hitting sticks, etc and did that for maybe 30 years um, and I still have contacts with that back in the UK. And I have a brother who was a professor of geography in Canada and a couple of years ago or so he uh, he sent me an email message saying well you might be interested in the following and um, uh, he'd been approached by the curator of what was to be a new museum in the city of Liverpool in uh, the UK, well, as you know, Liverpool is the home of the Beatles, and they were mounting an exhibition of of uh, uh, various aspects of music around the the Beatles and and and, and what influenced them. And during the 1950s, there was a, a a genre of music called skiffle, and it was the sort of music that anybody could play if you had a guitar. And you had a T chest bass, which was essentially a T chest with a string. Doom, 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 doom. You know, anybody can play it. And they wanted to illustrate how this sort of music was accessible to anybody. And on my brother's website, he is the uh, he's the webmaster for um, a, uh, a a jazz musician called Chris Barber, who's been playing jazz trombone for sixty odd years. And in one of the earlier incarnations of the Chris Barber Jazz Band was a musician who played the banjo called Lonnie Donegan, who also was a solo musician who played skiffle. And me and my brother at the ages of nine and seven, whatever it was, used to do this. My brother played the guitar and I played the T-chest bass. Well, for some reason or other, my brother had found a photograph of himself and myself entertaining my mother and a couple of friends and had got it on his website and through the internet uh, images search this curator of the museum uh, had found this image and said this is exactly what we're looking for can we use it in the Beatles Museum and he said sure and as far as I know two years later there we are on a poster eight foot by five as young boys of uh, nine and seven or whatever we were in the mid 1950s playing skiffle and of course then into the 60s goodies 50 years ago uh, the Beatles came along and uh, I suppose that was a time when my interest in music really grew and I've become quite passionate about music I m my house is not a happy house unless there's music playing and I have very broad taste in music but it's very very important part of my life yeah I've I've actually worked under five DGs at, at Erie in these last uh, almost 19 years first there was Lampy Klaus Lampy who who uh, hired me followed by George Rothschild Bob Havener as a, an interim DG, Ron Cantrell and Bob Ziegler, and they were all different.
very different. And I suppose you can think about, I mean, it, it, and, and the role of a DG in an international centre is very interesting. The role of the chief executive officer in any organisation is very different. I mean, because it changes um, the nature of the organisation. I mean, just to give you an analogy, the US is a very different place under Barack Obama than it was under George Bush. There are different things happening. But the CEO sets the tone. Now, I wasn't here when Klaus Lampe was, was appointed. That was, what, 88 or 89? But my understanding and recollections from talking to people in the early 90s is that Erie was not in a very healthy situation towards the end of the 1980s. It had not received a very good review and it was clear that uh, somebody had to come in and bring about some change. And this sort of harks back to what I was saying about this sort of self-satisfaction aspect of the Institute that I have observed over the years. Um, and clearly the physical plant at Erie was deteriorating markedly. So he, Lampe came in with a mandate to bring about some significant change and he did. Um, some new buildings went up, buildings were refurbished. Fortunately he was able to um, influence particularly the German government to support refurbishment of the facilities and there was a major staff change particularly in the senior levels and I think not just because I was part of that but I think it was very important for the organization because organizations can stagnate and you do need um, people to come in with new ideas new ways of doing things and I think the Institute has certainly benefited from the changes that Klaus Lampe brought about and you have to admire him for the changes that he made but he was quite a difficult person to work for I for the we overlapped for four years and I would say for over three years he and I had a an excellent relationship um, working in genetic resources um, I was very much involved in the intellectual property management side of things and actually helped to draft the, uh, with somebody from Stanford University, the first IP policy. Uh, it was at a time when you know, we, we had the Convention on Biological Diversity and there was lots of concerns about ownership of biological resources and lots of other, and the, and the CG was changing in this way. And I used to interact with Klaus Lampe almost on a daily basis. But Klaus was quite renowned for falling out with people quite dramatically. And from one day to the next, things could fall apart. I saw this happen with quite a lot of colleagues. And it eventually happened to me. Which I, I wouldn't say I was bitter about. I felt very sad about. Because it was absolutely nothing to do with the work that I was doing. Uh, and I, I felt that that was not an appropriate uh, reason for, shall we say, a, a good working relationship to start to fall apart. Funnily enough, when, when Klaus visited uh, the Institute about a year ago or so, um, he actually pulled me over into a corner and we talked about that period. Quite frankly and openly, and agreed that it wasn't our finest hour and decided to put you know that behind us that the 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 positive aspects of the relationship were much more important than some negative things that that had happened um, and I think you have to give you know Klaus his due in that that he it took him a long time but uh, I think he realized that perhaps he had upset some people more than he should have done and I think you also have to recognize that he brought about some significant change at the Institute, positive change, um, 
that the Institute really needed. From his departure up until Bob Ziegler was appointed in 2004, approximately 10 years, I personally think the Institute coasted without direction. Uh, now that may seem rather radical thing to say or controversial thing to say and when you have a vacuum like that the institute the staff start to interpret where they think the institute should be going because there's no central vision of what the institute is all about so George nice person Ron good manager never presented their vision for Erie, in my opinion. And when we set up the DPPC office, and one of the, one of the things we were keen to do was to try and bring some order, it was like a, a phrase I've used for a number of years, it was like herding cats. Everybody was off doing their own thing. Everybody had their own idea of what the Institute was about. And I think the big strength that Bob Ziegler has brought to the Institute is that not only is he a good scientist, first-rate intellect, but he had a vision for what he thought Erie should achieve. He may not be as good a manager per se uh, as perhaps Ron Cantrell, but he is... He is, I would say, of the five DGs, a leader in a way that the other four were not. And in this phase of fairly rapid expansion and at a time when the Institute itself is under considerable pressure from outside forces within this whole change process of the CGR, to have somebody who has got a vision and occasionally is not afraid of stepping on somebody's toes because he passionately believes in that vision and he's got the backing of the staff for that vision I think is a damn good thing. So it has been different. We've had I, I, Klaus had the leadership qualities but he had his flaws. We had two managers I don't really count Bob Havener in this and Bob was, is, is a beautiful man, he, 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 he was the right person for Erie in that one year, but, he, uh, but when he came, he, did, he, 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 he sort of gave a vision, he, he called the staff together, and I remember him saying the following, more or less, and I'll paraphrase, he said, the Institute has to move forward. As the interim DG, I will make the decisions that need to be made, and I will leave the decisions that can be left for my successor. But make no mistake, he said, I may be interim, but I am the DG. I am the boss. And please understand that. And you got a sense of somebody who was very confident in the position he was in and was going to do the best for, for the Institute. Um, he certainly was a, was a leader within the CG system. Um, I think with, 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 with Bob, um, the Institute is very fortunate to have um, a person of his caliber uh, in the position he has in this period of change within the CG. There was obviously he had realized within the overall management of the Institute there were uh, there were some perceived weaknesses that that needed to be supported and needed change brought about and um, um, I, I wouldn't say we saw eye to eye on, an, on, a, on, on, on a lot of things but it was very much more uh, a management perspective that he had rather than one as a visionary of where the institute should be going um, and I think any any organization 
uh, is better if you have somebody who is not only a good manager but has a clear view of where they want to take the organization. You know, when you think about the battles that have been won and the battles that have been lost, people will follow, sometimes unquestioningly, a good leader. When they understand what the Institute is trying to do and they also understand their part in achieving that vision. And I think, it, I personally think it's the role of a manager leader to be able to articulate that. Because if you do that, you will get the best out of the people that you're working with. Who was it? Was it George Bernard Shaw, no man is an island? I can't remember now, but there's a, there's a saying, no man is an island. And um, I think one of the, 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 the difference between working in an international center and a university, for example, is that one is encouraged within the centers to work with others. It's, it's, it's the name of the game. It's rather different in a university. It's a little bit more competitive. Everybody's off doing their own thing. And I suppose I'm, I'm the sort of person that likes to interact and work with others. Uh, and, and my career within the CG at SIP and at Erie has allowed me to, to do that. Um, and in different parts of the world. Um, I have to obviously think in terms of the person who supervised my my PhD, Jack Hawkes. Um, I've just completed writing a small biography of him, Oxford University Press publication. Uh, and that was quite special writing that. It was, it was only 1500 words, but to sort of condense somebody's life down into that and got me thinking about the sort of relationship that I had with him. It, it, it wouldn't get away with it today. I remember when, when we sat down to discuss what I might do for my PhD, he said, Mike, he said, I think we, I think we should work on the triploids, this type of potato. And that was about it. <laughs> the rest was up to me to decide what I wanted to do. Nevertheless, when I had done something and wanted to discuss it, he was always there to give me very solid feedback on the ideas I was putting forward or the things that I had written. And I think that has, that has stayed with me. Stayed with me when I was supervising my own PhD students. That, you know, that, that relationship that you build with, with somebody you're supervising is, is very important. And I think it's spilled over into the way that I've, I've inter you know, People, when they start to depend on each other, they, you know, you, you, it, 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 it's sort of like a contract. You don't want one side to, of, of the bargain to, to let the other down. Um, as I said earlier on, uh, many of the people in the early years of the, of, 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 of the CG were, were pioneers in their own right about uh, international agricultural research. But in, in those days, um, we, weren't, we weren't sort of restricted by a lot of the rules and regulations, if, I, if, that, if that's the term, that have seemed to have come in to guide how we do things. I mean, Dick Sawyer, when he was hiring people, he said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you in the, the, um, the passenger lounge in, 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 in Frankfurt Airport, for instance. And he'd interview somebody there and make them an offer. Um, and he came to Birmingham, he met me, and he made me an offer. And I moved to, you know, I moved to Peru. Um, so uh, there's l a lot more that has come in over the years that have, you know, constrict how we do, do business, probably in many ways for the better. But the people that I worked with earlier on were pioneers within international agricultural research. And, and that was a fantastic experience. I mean, here at, here at uh, uh, Erie, I, I formed a, uh, a, a close a friendship with uh, John Sheehy, I think a kindred spirit. I mean, uh, John Sheehy uh, thinks out, if, to use a cliche, thinks outside the box rather a lot. Um, and um, we, all, we also <laughs> shared a, a, a keen interest, common interest in wine. Uh, over, over many bottles we have uh, discussed the state of the world and state of agriculture, agricultural research. Um, and I think it's great having a friend like that, that you can, you know, the, 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 there, are no, there are no boundaries. You can sit down and, 
and, and talk about what interests you, uh, what your concerns are uh, about. And I suppose over the years he has been my um, closest, uh, closest colleague, although I've not actually worked with him professionally in the area of, of, of his work. And I, um, I'm, I've talked about working with the national staff in the Gene Bank and in DPPC, but I think over the last four years, some of the interaction that has given me the greatest satisfaction has in fact been the interaction with the people in your shop, Gene, in, 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 in CPS. Um, I mean, you've seen me over there quite a lot, uh, you know, and, 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 and throwing out ideas and having people in, in your shop who don't think I'm totally crazy, and, uh, or maybe they do, <laughs> uh, but taking some of those ideas and, 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 and together, we've, I think we have developed some fantastic products, uh, particularly the last two years of... Um, the annual report. We, I think we've, I think we've pushed the boundaries there a little bit. I think that, those were exciting, uh, interesting projects to to have undertaken. Um, uh, in our fiftieth anniversary year, we've been working on stamps. We've we've had a number of other things that, uh, you know, and of course, um, over the last ten years, we've been going to the annual the annual meetings of the CG. And putting up an eerie booth, and 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 and, and having your staff uh, develop the materials uh, based on ideas that we have we have developed together, and there's no doubt about it, the quality of materials coming out of CPS is top class, and that has been that has been a a, a particular area of satisfaction. Uh, there's one or two others that have been less satisfactory, but not not from CPS, I should hasten to add. But uh, but the the interaction with CPS has, has actually given me a it's been a lot of fun, and I've always believed that if you're not having fun, don't bother doing it. Uh, the the offices round round here with the other staff in in DPPC, um, you hear a lot of laughter, and that's not because we're not serious about what we do but we have a very relaxed uh, environment uh, where we, we work together because we want to work together there's no hierarchy everybody understands where they are in the hierarchy but it it's it's not an obvious hierarchy and we we have a lot of laughter a lot of fun together uh, and I think that uh, building of comfort levels also helps increase productivity and I've noticed over the years interacting with your staff, they have become much more comfortable interacting with me, uh, which I think also leads to enhanced productivity. I mean, it never ceases to amaze me. You can come up with an idea, oh, I think we ought to do this, and then, uh, you know, th then you get a product back, which just blows your socks off. And... Uh, that's tremendously satisfying. I think um, Erie is extremely fortunate to have the staff that it has. Um, I mean, if you if you compare the Philippines to uh, a number of um, other countries, it it has a um, a level of research support sophistication that you just don't find in other countries. You've got an educational system, it might be creaking a bit around the edges that is turning out competent people who are coming onto the job market. You've also got here at Erie, for good and for bad, or for good and less good, um, a workforce that has been committed over many, many years to the Institute. I mean, I think some turnover is always good for any organization, but you have people who have committed to the organization uh, essentially for the whole of their career. So there's that loyalty and it's a very strong loyalty, but I think this also says something about the Filipino character. 
I think the the one oh, it's not really negative, um, but it it harks back to something I was saying earlier on. I think it can sometimes lead to complacency that you know we are eerie, therefore we are good. And I've always said, look, we should not be saying we are good. Let others make those judgments. Um, you know, obviously the 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 the, the plaudits, the, the 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 recognition that comes to Erie, also spills over onto all of the staff. We are the institute is because of the staff, uh, and it's been extremely fortunate to 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 have the commitment that it that that it that it continues to enjoy. Um, certainly, I could not have done what I was able to achieve in the gene bank and here in DPPC unless I had had good staff. And I inherited uh, a group of staff that were waiting to be given the opportunity to do something and to show what they could do in the gene bank. I was given the opportunity here in DPPC to recruit the staff who I thought would make the best uh, team. Uh, so I, I have I have no uh, no no real uh, you know concerns there. I you know I was able to do what I wanted to do and get the people to help me do it. Con contrary to common belief here, I did not travel as much as everybody thought I did. So, and I've never felt that traveling for the sake of travel was was a worthwhile use of my time. So whereas I've, I've visited all of the genetic resources programs in Asia and met the people and, and saw what they were, they were about, I never felt that just going there to sort of wave the flag and was, was, a, was, was a, a useful thing to do. So when we got the Swiss funded um, project, five year biodiversity project, 95 to 2000, um, and I had a good group of staff around me, we essentially divided the countries up between us. The, 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 the geneticist and the anthropologist, uh, Jean-Louis Pham and Steve Morin, um, they were working in uh, the Philippines, in Vietnam and in India. So I thought, well, you know, if you're going to those countries on a regular basis, you can essentially be the liaison uh, between GRC and the genetic resources programs there. Um, I concentrated on Indonesia and the Lao uh, Democratic People's Republic, where we had a, a staff member based. Um, Baorong Lu was co collecting around many countries, and Yves Laresto, who had been here for goodness knows how many years, nearly 40 years before she left, at that time, she was certainly one of the old timers. Um, she sort of concentrated on Nepal and Bhutan and Myanmar and you know so we split that that up between us. One of the difficulties that the the and, I, and my contacts were with the genetic resources people and they were always under resourced and over ambitious uh, because they saw Iri as the model to follow. The classic example would be Myanmar, where they had a facility, goodness knows how many times bigger than the gene bank here, and they did not have the resources to turn anything on, essentially. Um, and it, one of the things that I, I, I tried to do working with them was to try to bring a sense of scale. You know, we have a gene bank of the type we have at Erie for, for these reasons. You know, it's a long-term facility for the whole of rice germplasm. If you're concentrating on the germplasm of your country, there are ways of going about doing that which don't you require you to involve uh, to invest several million dollars a year. It's not necessary. There are ways you can do things. But there's always this, and, and it's not just here in Asia, it's around the world, this feeling that you've got to build a gene bank. And the first thing you say, well, if you haven't got if you haven't got the electricity supply to turn the cold room on, what, what is the purpose of building a facility of this type? There are, there are better ways of achieving your, your goals. So that was a little bit of a, 
I wouldn't say attention, but it was a, a difference of perspective. Uh, and we were successful in some, some, in some countries in getting them to think in terms of a more sustainable approach. Uh, in others, it was it was a little more difficult. But I always found the people that I dealt with uh, uh, highly competent and extremely dedicated professionals, and uh, that was also a, a, again part of the, the 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 good interaction that I had during my my days as a as somebody working in a gene bank. Overrated. I mean, it was it was it was it was a political decision. Um, is it needed? If it makes people feel good, if it makes, uh, uh, if it brings focus and attention to this whole area, great. Was it absolutely necessary? I personally do not think so, uh, uh, because having that facility as such is not necessarily going to extend the life of the materials that are in it, because. A gene bank is like a computer, junk in, junk out. So one of the things we did early on in my tenure in, in GRC was to look at how we were producing seed to maximize the, their quality in terms of long-term survivability in cold store. If you have seeds which have an inherently short shelf life, either because of the nature of the material or because you haven't grown them and produced the seed in the right way prior to sticking them in a cold room, sticking them in the Arctic isn't going to make any difference. So from, from the purely technical point of view, I think Svalbard was an irrelevance. From a political point of view, it was probably a damn good thing. But uh, um, it would have been nice if, well, you know, things have changed. I mean, one of the reasons I was quite happy to leave my genetic resources work, and this sort of comes back to a frustration now that I think about it, was that genetic resources work was becoming less technical and more political. You know, with the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Commission on Genetic Resources, the, uh, the International Treaty on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, and the negotiations that were going on. And frankly, I have sat through days of negotiations in Rome at FAO, when frankly having a frontal lobotomy would have been a most useful uh, uh, a useful asset, but the interminable discussions over wording in square brackets in these international negotiations, they put things in square brackets that are still being negotiated. But interminable dis discussions that really, uh, I don't think, uh, um, uh, moved, us, moved us forward very fast. In, in, in our management of genetic resources. And they're still negotiating things. It's like all these international treaties. Maybe I'm being cynical. But um, I was not sorry to give up that side of genetic resources. And I remember about a year after Rory Sackville Hamilton, my successor, came, maybe a couple of years, and there was a board meeting here and I had to give a presentation or something to do with my work as, as a director. But the, the presentation to the board immediately before me was Rory talking about the, the international treaty and some of the implications for germplasm access. And I do remember saying as a sort of a preface to my talk to the board, I'm glad it was Rory talking about those things and not me. Because of the very concerns I've just expressed, it had become you know, political rather than an interest in the germplasm as such. We've been talking about the sort of the, um, the various careers I've had, which has which Im involved both research and uh, administration. I suppose on balance, I've enjoyed more the managerial roles. Having said that, 
you know, I've I've been quite um, pleased with the the research output that we've had and we've had had published. And I was checking my um, my publications list uh, recently to check it was up to date, and realised that of the almost 200 pub, no, it's 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 over 200 communications refereed books etc over half of that has actually uh, published while I was working in Erie at the gene bank so in a 10-year period was was really quite productive uh, in terms of research output and some of it has I think has uh, had a had a good influence and then um, another thing that we, 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 we published when I was still at the University of Birmingham which uh, was a little controversial at the time. Uh, we organised a, a, a small workshop in 1989, and the book was published in 1990 on genetic resources and climate change. 20, 20 years ago, and okay, there were sceptics now. There were a lot more sceptics then. It said climate change, no such thing, um, and unfortunately, the book. Um, I think it was perhaps ahead of its time. It's not been as widely cited as as it might. Have. People are you know totally unaware that you know 20 years ago, here was this book talking about pending climate change and ways to adapt to to climate change and that genetic resources and the exploitation of genetic resources collections would be one way. Of, uh, of 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 mitigating the effect, effects of uh, climate change, so that I think was uh, quite a landmark publication at the time, but has disappeared into the fog fog of obscurity. <laughs> when I moved into the um, DPPC uh, position, you know, I started to see the the institute and its management obviously from from a very different perspective, and started to build a relationship with the donors in a way that as a, as a, as a researcher you just don't have. Um, and, and in the 10 years there's been some quite marked changes in personnel in the donor community uh, and it's quite a challenge constantly renewing that relationship with different donors. And as new people come into the donor uh, agencies and, and policy changes you're having to adapt to that and understand where their interests lie. Um, I also mentioned that I came into uh, DPPC at a time when it was like herding cats. Everybody was interpreting their own thing and feeling also that everybody had license to go out and market whatever idea they had with the donors. And I came in, in, in not long after I, I uh, took over this position or established this position, started to go and visit donors. In fact, my, my first experience of meeting the donors and what their interests were directly was when I attended what was then the midterm meeting in Durban in May 2001. That was about two and a half, three weeks after I'd assumed the position. We flew off and you know, was thrown into this CGR, CGIR maelstrom of, of meetings and coffee breaks and talking in the corridors and trying to get people interested in the Institute. And I would say the majority of the people I met in 2001 are not in position today. So you're constantly having to sort of renew um, that relationship and explain to a new group of people that comes through the donor agency what the Institute is all about. Now, in 2001, I was essentially given full responsibility for interacting with the donors, with the exception of two donors, Japan, because of the rather special relationship we've had with Japan, and that's normally been handled directly through the DG's office, and USAID, because with the DG being a US citizen and, and frequently going through the US, it was felt that that was uh, a more appropriate relationship. So I started to develop um, an understanding of the European donors. Now, although many of them are members of the European Union, they also have their own 
individual policies and getting to try and understand that complexity was, was quite daunting. Um, the one thing I came to realize is that Erie had prob probably been ignoring the donors to some extent. And while the donors wanted us to go and visit, they didn't want to be swamped. So they, they, they wanted a, a focal point of contact. They wanted somebody to come through perhaps once a year, twice at most. They certainly didn't want a constant stream of Erie staff turning up trying to sell an idea. Um, because the other thing that I came to realize is that um, for many of the staff working in the donor agencies, the CG is a very, very, very small proportion of their overall responsibilities. In some sense, compared to what other to other uh, responsibilities they have, we're we're like a a flea on a dog's back. You know that that's the level of importance, and yet major decisions about funding are made with somebody who's already thinking about half a dozen other rather more important things in terms of their own portfolio of responsibilities. So getting to understand those dynamics I think was, in, was important. But also, as I've talked about several times in this interview, is establishing relationships, getting to know who these counterpart people were. So that, A, um, you go to a meeting you recognize them and they recognize you and you build a level of confidence that you can pick up the phone and know that somebody will talk to you or if you send an email you'll get an answer because they know who it's coming from and you've built that sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship and we've worked very hard at that and Corinth has also been working hard at that um, and, uh, and it has paid off. One of, the, one of the most common things we have to do after we've got a contract up and running or a grant up and running is to ask a donor for a no-cost extension. It's legit, legitimate in most cases because there's always a, a slow start-up phase to a project. And although a, a contract starts on this day, it may be six months before you've got the staffing in place or what have you. So there's always going to be a little bit of... Uh, um, spillover beyond the normal uh, contract dates. And we found that with quite a number of donors now, because um, we've, we've shown that Erie is a reliable partner and, cr and has credibility, that we do send in the documentation that they want, that we do provide quality reports generally on time, uh, we can send an email in and most of our business is in fact done by emails now. We've, there's hardly a, a document is sent by post. Uh, it all goes in as uh, file attachments. We can often send a, a note in to a donor in Europe towards the end of an afternoon here, knowing it's first thing in the morning there, and within half an hour or an hour have a reply back approved. Because they know us, they know how we work, we know what we're sending, etc. And I think that has been very, very uh, positive. Now, since Bob Ziegler joined as DG, and even more recently since Arkim Doberman uh, became the DDG Research, they themselves have become much more hands-on in terms of donor relations, making those visits, etc. And I've, over the last couple of years, sort of pulled out of that rather more. Um, obviously still keeping a, a, a contact relationship by email, but on personal visits I haven't done that for a while. So th that, that dynamic has changed within the Institute, but it is important that, that we still maintain that sort of focal point within the Institute, and of course it was the DPPC office and will become the Office of External Relations in the future.